Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Hey Michael, thanks for uh, coming all the way out to Austin to uh, work on some DNS for a few days with me and Beth. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, been wanting to sit down for quite a while. Um, and obviously the events of 2020 kind of got in the way of that, but, um, maybe just start for folks by, uh, giving a little bit of your background. You grew up in Northern California, right? Yeah. Grew up in Northern California and, uh, eventually went to school down in San Diego at UC San Diego. What sports did um, you play growing up? Um, my primary sport or the sport that I was most passionate about was tennis and, uh, interested in that from an early age and, uh, played other sports, other organized sports, but tennis was the one that I was drawn to and had the passion for. So early on, uh, specialized in that played, uh, lots of junior tennis tournaments, trained a lot, eventually, um, played in college and, um, that obsession or passion kind of drove me to the, the way that I practice today. Um, I'm a chiropractor. I'm based out of San Diego, California, as you know, um, I s kind of specialize in rehabilitation, sports medicine. Um, I am also, so I have the private practice there. I'm fortunate enough to also be able to spend some time, um, on the PGA tour and the world surf league tour as part of their, uh, sports medicine crew or team. And also fortunate enough to be part of USA surfing performance committee, um, helping with, uh, assessing and training the, the. Uh, U.S. athletes, the surfing athletes for the upcoming Olympics. Cool. So, um, today, obviously, the thing we want to talk about is this super kind of deep dive into something called dynamic neuromuscular stabilization. Now, folks listening to this have probably heard me talk about this in the past. Uh, you know, if they follow me on social media, they'll notice from time to time I'm doing movements um, that probably look a little silly. Uh, sometimes working with you or working with Beth or working with another colleague of ours, Michael Stromsness is actually how we all met. Um, but I think for the purpose of this discussion, let's assume a person has never heard of DNS, um, has never heard of the Prague school or any of these things. Can you in a somewhat succinct, but not terribly brief manner, explain to people how all of this, um, school of rehabilitation coalesced around this idea of what we call DNS. So going back to the founding fathers of the Prague school and what these various, um, sort of insights were that each of them had and, and how mm -hmm. that sort of came together. Okay. So, um, DNS or dynamic neuromuscular stabilization kind of built on some pioneers of functional rehabilitation. Um, there's many, uh, that have been part of the Prague school of rehabilitation, but I think, uh, talking about the influence on the development of dynamic neuromuscular stabilization by professor Pavel Kolage, who runs the, the rehabilitation department at Prague school, um, uh, at this time, I think we need to go back, um, post uh, World War II, Cold War era, 1950s is where um, Prague School of Rehabilitation was was really founded, and it was uh, founded as part of the medical faculty of Charles University in in um, in Prague in the Czech Republic, or formerly Czechoslovakia, now Czech Republic, and being post uh, post World War II, Cold War era. So they were in Eastern Europe behind the wall. Um, that may have been a factor for their, uh, not reliance, but tendency towards the use of, of observation in both diagnostic diagnosis, 
um, both observation and palpation for diagnosis and treatment. Um, all three of these pioneers were neurologists. Um, and, and who, who were the three? So the three, um, Vladimir Yonda, uh, Carl Levitt and Balclav Voita. Um, professor Yonda, um, he had a keen sense of observation. Um, and he formulated, um, concepts and principles that tied into postural, habi postural habituation, um, specifically the tendency for specific musculature to tend towards tightness and other musculature to tend towards weakness. And he, he termed this, uh, upper cross and lower cross syndrome. So for example, with the, an upper cross syndrome, meaning the neck and shoulder region, um, with demands of, of life and the, the tendency towards postural habituation, such as with sustained seated postures, um, there's a tendency towards, uh, the, the muscles in the back of the neck, the occipital muscles, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is the muscle that also attaches to the skull and down to the uh, sternoclavicular joint, the pec muscles, the upper traps, that musculature would tend towards a tightening or an overactivation. Other mus musculature in the upper extremity, the serratus, which attaches to the ribs and, and the back of the, the scapula, um, the deep neck flexors, the middle and lower traps would, would have a tendency to tend towards the, a weakness. And with that um, tendency f towards overutilization or hypertonicity and underutilization, um, inhibition, weakness, um, that would also, he also recognized that that would affect the um, quality of, of, of movement throughout the kinematic chain and subsequently would lead to overload in specific areas throughout that kinematic chain. So that was um, a big contribution on his part, um, his colleague. Where would those places of overload be? So if you, if you have this tightness in the muscles you've described, the weakness in the muscles you've described, what is the consequence of that? Where does that load get distributed? Right. So you, with that imbalance and that postural uh, tendency towards postural habituation, you would see a tendency to overload in the transitional areas throughout the spine and throughout the extremity. So um, I didn't go into the specifics for lower cross syndrome. Lower cross syndrome, you have a tendency for the flexor, hip flexor complex to be overactive, tightened. So the psoas, the ileus psoas, rectus femoris, um, the uh, uh, back extensor musculature will also tend towards tightness. And then the weakness or the inhibition will tend to toward, be towards the lower abdominal region and the gluteal region. So looking at it globally, um, you would see a tendency to overload again throughout the extremity, um, throughout the extremities, so the, the hip joint, the knee joint, um, but also specifically dealing with the spine, the lumbar sacral region, thoracic lumbar region, and the cervical thoracic region, all the areas where you see the transition of, of the curvatures, uh, lordosis and kyphosis. And um, uh, with that um, tendency for overload, you will get repetitive stresses on the passive structures uh, within that kinematic chain. So uh, as a clinician, uh, we know that if you tend to image these areas, or if you image the spine, these are the areas that tend to have the most degenerative changes or the most disc uh, pathology. And those changes aren't, uh, aren't usually uh, traumatic. They're not acute. They're accumulated over time. So the, the observation of these postural patterns or postural syndromes, and then the recognition of the um, dysfunction uh, with, with movement efficiency that it caused 
led him to develop specific treatments, um, uh, both uh, exercise-wise and manual-wise, to to address those those issues. Um, his colleague Carl Levitt. No, but Yon, uh, Yonda also had suffered polio as a as a as a youngster, didn't he? Yeah. So he he had the suffered the residual effects, the post polio type syndrome, and that was probably a, a motivation for his his passion for rehabilitation, his his passion for the observation of, of movement. Um, uh, his his uh, colleague Carl Levitt, also a neurologist, um, he shared that that observation palpation, um, uh, not technique, but uh, tendency to utilize that for diagnosis and, and treatment. He he specifically focused on joint dysfunction, soft tissue dysfunction, as it related to those those upper and lower cross syndromes. So he developed specific mobilization techniques for both the, the joint and the soft tissues, um, a, addressing what they were seeing with those, those postural, uh, postural habituation and movement dysfunction. Um, the third kind of pioneer, also a neurologist, uh, but also a pediatric neurologist, was Václav Vojta. And he... Uh, his his observations observing the ontogenesis or the, the development of motor function after birth during the first 12 months where the postural uh, our postural foundations are established neurologically um, he developed uh, specific uh, tests called postural reactions where he could uh, tell the the quality or the health of the maturation of the central nervous system during that period of time. And by doing this, he could assess whether there was pathology um, or a healthy developing central nervous system. So he, he developed uh, seven specific postural uh, reaction tests, developed and modified some other ones, utilized uh, primitive reflexes, and uh, just observation, observation of the infant during development to be able to recognize the biological age, meaning the, the maturation of that central nervous system as compared to the chronological age. So for example, if you had a six month old infant that was moving and reacting like a six week old infant, that would be an indication that there was some central nervous system pathology. He, his focus was on uh, treatment of the cerebral palsy infant and, and patient. And he was able to utilize that observation, those, uh, uh, the observation of the postural reactions, the assessment of the primitive reflexes to um, recognize early on before it would manifest clinically so that interventions could be taken earlier on to take advantage of the neuroplasticity, the ability of the, the brain to form motor engrams um, uh, more efficiently and work around those central lesions that you see with cerebral palsy. So he, um, all three of these uh, kind of founding um, members or founders of Prague School of Rehabilitation were or Professor Collage, Collage's uh, colleagues, mentors, instructors. They shared patients, they discussed cases, and um, uh, Pavel Collage developed or evolved all that, that knowledge and experience into what we call dynamic neuromuscular stabilization today. Now, before um, Pavel came along, what was the, so, so fast forward, this started in the 50s, but fast forward to the 90s. Uh, so the Prague School is well-established. You have these sort of founding fathers, so to speak. 
what were the applications of the Prague School at that time? How much of it was rehabilitation for kids with cerebral palsy or rehabilitation for people who were injured versus prehabilitation for athletes? Like what, how, what was the breadth of the applicability of the Prague School? Right. So uh, Prague School uh, was, it's a group of clinicians and um, probably more of the, the early 90s, the application was primarily rehabilitation. Uh, cerebral palsy, general population, um, uh, with uh, Pavel, uh, Professor Kolosh, just to go in a little bit of his background, um, you know, again, he, he's the head of Prague School of Rehabilitation. He's also head clinician uh, for the Czech Olympic teams and Czech national sports teams, hockey, soccer, men's and women's tennis. He himself was a high level, uh, uh, Olympic level gymnast. So um, he, uh, his, his work, he's a pediatric uh, physiotherapist as well. Um, his work with those three pioneers, uh, his experience as an athlete, his experience treating cerebral palsy and, and infants, um, he took that or started to apply that base of knowledge to the athletic population. And the, the focus of, of and the, the thinking of these, these founders of Prague School and, and Prague School today is it's, uh, the, the influence of the central nervous system is huge and kind of king as far as the uh, facilitating the efficiency of transfer of load throughout that kinematic chain. So early on, the focus was more rehabilitation um, over multiple populations. But maybe late 90s, um, early 2000s, Pavel started to uh, apply those teachings to that athletic population. And um, there's... Meaning to an uninjured athletic population or to um, an injured athletic population? Probably at that time, more of an injured population. Um, to kind of stand, stand out athletes that he was able to work with and integrate his concepts and principles of dynamic stability were uh, Jean Zelezny, hopefully I say that right. He's a, he was a, a Olympic uh, javelin thrower, three-time gold medal winner, still holds the, the record for uh, uh, javelin, uh, 98.48 meters, I believe. And um, the other one is Yamir Yager, who a uh, hockey player, Czech hockey player. Um, he, uh, he was able to, uh, help and work with them, uh, help them rehabilitate from injuries, but then also integrate the concepts and principles of dynamic neuromuscular stabilization to one, uh, decrease the risk of re-injury, but two, also provide the potential for better performance. And we can talk about specifics of those concepts and principles. Yeah, let's, let's, so, so we're, we're into the early 2000s where now Pavel's basically taking <clears throat> some of the, the, the fundamental principles from the Prague School and creating this, this new discipline. Let's use each of the words to explain to people what this is. So dynamic, of course, is movement, mm -hmm. right? It's not just static. It applies to in, in motion. Um, neuromuscular, um, I think explains the connection between the nervous system, both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, but really, as you said, an emphasis on the central nervous system and how that connects to the muscular system. So a lot of people, I think, assume that acts of strength are purely muscular and they don't realize the neurologic control of those things. 
Uh, for me personally, the hardest one to explain to an unsuspecting audience is stabilization. Mm -hmm. Now I have a way that I like to explain it, but I, I want to hear you go first. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I think it, it, it's important to, uh, talk about the utilization of developmental kinesiology, um, as a way to explain posture and explain dynamic stabilization. Um, when we're first born functionally and structurally, we are immature. So our central nervous system is still maturing. Our bones are still forming the first weeks of life, first four to six weeks of life, uh, the, the lower central nervous system structures, the brainstem levels kind of dominant. So primitive reflexes are dominant. Um, but there's so examples of that suck reflex, sucking gag, reflex, grasping, reflex, grasping, reflex, grasping, yeah. you know, obviously being able to blink. I mean, the most primitive reflexes that our species, I mean, we take these for granted. Mm -hmm. So they help keep us alive during that, that period of time. So as that central nervous system matures, and if it's maturing in a healthy way, by a three month period of time, actually, let me go back, usually starting maybe eight weeks, you, we start to facilitate the, the synergy, coordination and timing of the deep stabilizing group of, of musculature. And that's diaphragm, pelvic floor, the entire abdominal wall, the intersegmental spinal musculature that runs throughout the entire spine. All right, I'm going to stop you right here. We are going to talk about these things so much that I want to make sure people understand them. So let's go okay. back to the first one. Everybody's heard of their diaphragm, mm -hmm. but let's put some actual um, metrics to it. It's a dome-shaped muscle. It's a striated muscle, mm -hmm. but it has kind of a, a, a non-muscular part as well. But I think what most people don't appreciate is how big it is, right? Yeah. And how, I, I can't even remember. It's been, you know, back when I was, you know, in school, I had to know every attachment of it, right. but it, um, do, do you recall how far it attaches down and up on the, on both the, the ribs and the vertebral bodies? Yeah. So the diaphragm, just think of it like a big parachute or a big sheath of, of muscle that separates the abdominal cavity from the, the heart and lungs. The attachments, it has attachments on the lower six ribs on the, uh, back of the xiphoid process, which is a little bone at the end of the sternum. And then also attachments on, uh, L1, L2, uh, vertebra. So that's right amazing. around the, the thoracic lumbar junction. Yeah. Um, so, so that's just an enormous expanse mm -hmm. of attachment attachments being, you know, where the muscles attach and anchor. And therefore that gives you a sense of what their lever capacity is, what they can actually contract. Right. So that there's those attachments and then there's a central tendon that when the, the diaphragm activates, so one of the primary functions is respiration. So I go to take a breath in, that diaphragm activates, descends, the central tendon drops, the lungs expand, that change in pressure, and you're able to draw air into the lungs. And then there's a recoil of the diaphragm and the air comes out. So there's a primary respiratory function during the first weeks of development or ontogenesis, which is the study of motor development after birth, there's primary respite. It's primary respiratory function. The central nervous system has not matured to the point to create the synergy with, within the other deep stabilizing group of musculatures musculature to create that fixed point through the trunk and the pelvis. So by, by around three months period of time, that central nervous system has matured to the point where now the hardwired genetic ingrained motor programs start to manifest themselves. So we start to see this coordinated activity of that deep group of musculature so what are the other, what are the, what, so we've now, I mean, for me, and I think for many people, <clears throat> a very helpful image is that of a cylinder. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, a, the strongest possible cylinder, right. Would have a big top, a big bottom and a beautifully symmetric 
you know, uh, side compartment to it, right? A lousy right. cylinder would have a tiny little bottom, a big top and a dented middle. Mm -hmm. So if the diaphragm formulates the top of that cylinder, what makes up the bottom of that cylinder? So the bottom of the cylinder, we're looking at the pelvic floor, which is uh, an area of musculature, uh, basically where we, the babies come out. And um, that musculature will coordinate the um, regulation or management of intra-abdominal pressure that is created with the descending of the diaphragm. So the diaphragm, three, three main functions, respiration, but there's also a, obviously this, a huge postural function where it descends even more and creates an intra-abdominal pressure so that uh, when that pressure is created, that diaph the pelvic floor will eccentrically load, meaning it's active, but uh, musculature is active, but stretches. You can think of it like wind blowing into a sail, where the wind blows into the sail, it, it opens and activates, and then it holds and maintains the pressure. But then at the same time, we have the entire abdominal wall, which consists of the, the rectus muscles, our six-pack muscles, our oblique musculature, which is musculature that uh, crosses the body, comes up and has attachments onto the thoracic cage or the rib cage. Um, and then a, a big one called transverse abdominus, which wraps around um, from the, the, the back, the thoracolumbar fascia, around to the front. So as that diaphragm descends to, to facilitate a stabilizing function, that intra-abdominal pressure is, is created, that musculature uh, reacts to the pressure, there's an eccentric load and then an isometric. And then as we coordinate, so we have respiratory function, postural function, but we have to now coordinate between both respiratory and postural functions. So our central nervous system, our brain, needs to manage that pressure to provide enough stability, but also allow the diaphragm to also uh, allow the lungs to expand. This coordination is usually where we see people kind of falling apart. And if they fall apart, they'll tend towards what Yanda saw, which is that overutilization. So in the lower cross syndrome of the extensor musculature and the flexor musculature, because we lose that synergy of that deep stabilization. And if we lose that synergy and that ability to create that fixed point, then our brains are, will do it, do their jobs, which is to find a way to still move and, and do tasks that we need to do. But in doing so, we'll go to more of a high threshold or like I you know, described, a, more of a compensatory pattern. So developmentally, that three-month period of time is where we ideally will have that synergy coordination and timing of that deep group of musculature that will allow the infant to create a fixed point through the trunk and the pelvis. And then also with that management of that intra-abdominal pressure, there's a loading on the front of the spine. And with that loading, we get uh, an, an uprighting effect throughout the spine. So then the intersegmental spinal musculature are eccentrically loading and managing that pressure against the spine to help with that uprighting effect and that unloading effect. Let's again make sure people know exactly what we mean because we're going to use the terms a lot. When you talk about eccentrically versus concentrically loading, um, <clears throat> I mean, to me, the easiest way to define it is just using the definitions, right? So a muscle is concentrically loaded when it's getting shorter as it's yes. being loaded. Eccentrically is getting longer as it's being loaded. So uh, for example, a bicep curl, this is the concentric phase of yes. loading. This is the eccentric phase of loading. Yes. And yes. I think what's, what a lot of people take for granted is both of those are important, yeah. but most people when training tend to emphasize the concentric and don't realize the eccentric. I heard a great story. I think it was actually from Michael Stromsness that 
when a group of U.S. weightlifters visited a group of Eastern European weightlifters, I don't know, maybe it was even you that told this story, they realized that they were counting reps differently. So the American lifters would consider a rep one is up and down. So that was, they were putting all their effort into the concentric, but then, you know, more or less dropping the weight on the way down, not really focusing on the effort to put the weight down. And the Eastern European lifters were doing the opposite, right? They were counting it as two reps. A re it's up, one, down, two. So it was just as much effort into that eccentric. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's not to say one is right or, the, or, or, or wrong because they serve different purposes. Obviously, more emphasis on the eccentric will create more hypertrophy. Um, so, so there are times that you want both. But... Um, Again, when you look at, for example, and we'll get to this, I'm sure, but when you look at um, hip abduction, the importance of being able to eccentrically control that is such an important part of injury prevention. And you can spend all the time in the world working on concentrically doing that. So later today, when we actually do some stuff on the mat, you'll have some exercises to demonstrate that. Yeah, yeah. So what the, the observation having knowledge of the developmental kinesiology or the ontogenesis and watching that maturation of the central nervous system and with that healthy maturation seeing the <clears throat> synergy of the deep stabilization um, providing that fixed point and then allowing efficient transfer of force and load throughout that that trunk and pelvis area um, what, uh, these pioneers, uh, Voita, Yonda, Levitt, uh, Collage, uh, noticed was the importance of the quality, basically training that central nervous system, because if you can facilitate that ideal stabilization, uh, stereotype and, and synergy, then you provide um, what uh, Professor Collage calls centration throughout that, that chain of movement, throughout that kinematic chain. And what he describes centration as is, uh, for example, let's say you have the hip joint, um, is the ability to maintain an ideal position of the, the femur and the acetabulum, which is the hip joint, throughout that full range of motion. In order to do that, you need a synergy or a nice interplay between agonist and antagonist, like you described the, the biceps curl. So an interplay between um, concentric, eccentric activity of the opposing musculature around the joint to help maintain that position. And if that is compromised throughout any part of that kinematic chain, it's going to affect it. The, the quality of centration or transfer of force and load um, above and below that region. The quality of uh, that synergy coordination timing of that deep stabilization is what Prague School is focusing on with assessment and with their, their treatment methods. And <clears throat> this is based out of that observation of developmental kinesiology, which is the neurophysiological aspects of the maturing locomotor system. So that's their, they utilize that as their definition of dynamic movement, dynamic posture, ideal, uh, ideal posture. So let's go back to <clears throat> the, the three month old infant and start talking about what normal developmental milestones are through the lens of DNS and, um, like picking it up at three months. So, um, what is, what is a three month old infant starting to demonstrate and how is that progressing as they become six months, nine months, a year, et cetera? Right. So, uh, at three months with that ability to create that fixed point, uh, now the larger, uh, longer musculature, uh, and larger, uh, muscle groups have something to anchor off of. So, Creating that fixed point, for example, allows the infant to now turn their head and fix their gaze. Prior to that, during those first weeks of life, you know, there's the ability to, to 
to fix their, their gaze is not there. By three months, providing that, that stable point, now they can turn, fix their gaze, and now they start to get more of the somatosensory input from the environment, which is going to trigger an external cue or a drive to, to start to explore. Um, the infant at that period of time can lift the, their legs out of the base of support so they can you'll see a triple flexion, so 90 degrees at the hip, 90 degrees at the knee, neutral position of the ankle joint or subtalar joint. They'll be able to bring their, their hands together and bring their hands to their, to their mouth along. And, and let's explain what's actually required to do that, because again, most adults would take that for granted, but what is it neuromuscularly that, that is being hardwired in that three-month-old infant that is pretty impressive in, in when you really stop to think about it, that they're able to bring both legs up, um, coordinate that movement. And by the way, are they necessarily doing that the way, you know, uh, a 50 year old person would do that if you laid them on their back? Like I, having now watched a lot of infants, they tend to all kind of do it in a very similar way. Whereas adults tend to not do it in a certain way. Right. So, um, neurologically, the, the coordination and timing of that deep stabilization uh, group of musculature needs to be on point to be able to create an, uh, a fixed point so that, the, again, the, the larger muscle groups can anchor off that to, to bring the legs up. Now, the infant has different, you know, there's a different thoracic cage size at that point, their head in relation to their body is bigger their limb length is bigger they're still growing the mu the the bones are still forming so that's much different than a 50 year old our, our limb proportions are different our mobility is going to be different we may have different um, body proportions you know mobility but we we all went through these developmental milestones and uh, most of us develop uh, our central nervous system in a, a healthy way. So we still have those same motor patterns that our central nervous system is going to want to kick into. Um, some of the uh, efficiency of accessing those nice stereotypical motor patterns that we're born with can be compromised due to uh, soft tissue, dysfunction, rigidity, lack of range of motion throughout the throughout our joints, um, you know, postural habituation that, that Yonda described. Um, all that factors into our, our can override the access to those ideal patterns. Um, what Prague School tries to do is, with the specific assessments, ass assess that efficiency of that deep stabilization system, uh, whatever age that we're at, and then utilize specific what we call active exercises, which are based off of the developmental milestones, which we'll, we'll get back to in a second, um, to utilize specific points of support and positioning to help wake up or facilitate those patterns that we, we still have as adults. So uh, three months of age is the start of that ability to, to create a sagittal stabilization. Tell people what sagittal means versus coronal. Um, so sagittal is kind of like straight ahead. Uh, sure. Frontal plane would be if you're on your side uh, or to, to the side. And then there's transverse plane, which is uh, think about rotating in the, the transverse plane. So, so what happens now as they approach six months of age? So three months, you see the start. Four months, that coordination is usually complete. Four, four, four and a half months. Once you've, you've, they've completed that, that ideal uh, facilitation of a fixed point, now they start to be able to utilize the oblique slings and you'll start to see some differentiation uh, in the pelvis and, and the limbs. 
And um, uh, as that uh, synergy gets more and more efficient, which means better, better management of that intra-abdominal pressure, you'll see the hips coming up into higher position, the legs coming up into being able to come up into a higher position, the, the infant's uh, range of, of reach will, will improve as well. At four months, they're able to touch the groin area. At five months, they can reach their knees. At six months, they can reach their feet. And then by seven months, they're bringing the foot to the, to the mouth. The, uh, there's enough synergy. And, and just to be clear, yeah. most people would say, is that just a result of increasing flexibility? But really the answer is not so much that they have more flexibility. They were quite flexible at birth. Right. It's, it's more that they now have the motor control and the stability to coordinate something that is everywhere from shoulder to foot right. or hand to foot, basically. Right. And do it in, in, in a, an efficient manner. So, uh, you know, I'm a parent, you're a parent and you remember when the, when the kids were developing and I, I, I get this all the time. They're like, Oh, my son was rolling all the way over at three months. Um, there, that is possible. They can, uh, normally, well, not normally, but ideally at that six month period of time, there's enough of that synergy and coordination and timing that the infant, you'll see the infant at that time rolling onto its stomach. Now, they could maybe do it at three months, but they're not going to do it with that coordination and that efficiency of transfer of force and load. You may see them turn and kind of revert back to more of that the newborn posture, meaning uh, they're finding a way to turn. They're using more of a compensatory pattern to make that action happen. Kind of the same thing you see with movement with adults. Uh, if the, the synergy coordination timing of deep stabilization is, is not on point, they find a way to move. But when they move, as with uh, the first weeks of life, the, the newborn infant, you'll see uh, anterior pelvic tilt, you see a flaring of the rib cage, the shoulders, you'll see elevation, protraction, and reclination or extension through the cervical spine. The newborn, when they look or when they move, the whole body is, is moving. They don't have that ability to create that fixed point, but they're still able to, uh, to make movements. As they're going through the developmental milestones, uh, with that motivation or that drive to move and explore their environment, they may find ways to, you know, reach that toy, but not be creating the ideal centration and stabilization. Um, with the central nervous system maturation, it's not like at three months, four months, six months, boom, they wake up and automatically are there in this perfect synergy coordination timing. As that central nervous system is maturing, there, there's thousands of trials and errors. They're forming the brain mapping and motor engrams, finding the right points of support as the, the coordination of the central nervous system is kicking in. So you may see uh, at the beginning of, of six months and they're turning, you know, maybe they're not able to uh, keep the alignment of the diaphragms during the, the turning, but they're still able to do it. Maybe by then uh, three weeks into it, now their coordination and timing has become more efficient and better. And they're able to make that turn with a better quality of, of activation. So how does it go from there? What gets them to crawling and ultimately standing? Right. So what you see with the developmental milestones um, the start of at three months, uh, we talked about with the newborn, you have more of the lower, uh, central nervous system structures are maturing at three months. We see more maturation in the subcortical region of the central nervous system. And that's where we get the manifestation of these, uh, postural foundations. So 
as that central nervous system matures, the certain milestones, three months, four months, five, six, seven, you'll see the infant starting to be able to attain higher, more unstable positions. And this, this, these developmental milestones are moving towards basically the verticalization process, going from either supine on the back or prone, and then uh, working their way up trial and error, uh, learning with that healthy central nervous system maturation, where uh, at seven months they're able to come to their side uh, eight months, they come up into what we call a, a high oblique sit position. Nine months, they're able to crawl. Um, uh, 10, 11 months, you'll see them being able to attain like a kneeling position. 12 months, they're squatting. 13, 14 months, they're standing. And then 14, 16 months, you know, on average, you see this start of, of ambulation. Now, this is, is variable. Some kids, my son was walking at 10 months, others maybe 15 months, 16 months. So there's variability within uh, these milestones of, of where, where we see the, the infants. But on average, these specific points, you'll see a specific uh, uh, competency, instability, and uh, reaching or moving towards that verticalization process. Now, if you exclude, um, you know, cases of pathology like CP and things like that, where there are injuries that are preventing the neuromuscular development and, and the achievement of these milestones, um, is it more or less the case that, you know, all kids are, who are, you know, given the fair chance to sort of explore and go about these things naturally, will reach a certain age, call it two or three, um, and they'll be quite healthy from a, from a dynamic, uh, you know, and movement standpoint. Like, is it, you know, for example, like yesterday we spent a bunch of time looking at my three and a half year old and, uh, you know, it's, it's frankly, it's a clinic in movement at that age. Right. Um, is it safe to assume basically all three-year-olds move really, really well? Like they haven't uh, started to get into the habituated uh, movement patterns that will begin to destroy them, right? Yeah. So uh, Voita and, and others talk about usually what they see is around 70% of new you know, infants are going to have that healthy central nervous system maturation, uh, go through the first weeks of life, the postural foundations, the, the three to 12 months, the subcortical, and then from two, four to six, six years of age, you have more of the cortical maturation where you see fine motor dexterity and movement, you know, ability to, to write, and you see the, uh, language develop and you see motor learning. Um, uh, so, and so sorry, the subcortical phase goes till about two, um, three, yeah, three, three to 12 months is where we see these okay. the postural foundations. Uh, after that, you start to get that cortical integration Got maturation. It. But the the um, the motor learning and and the the process yeah they obviously I mean, it, overlap it's like two to six yeah, yeah. but I mean and beyond now know? now I'm surprised to hear you say so, only seventy percent right so, and this is uh, I don't know if I, I can't say the study maybe it's their observation um, so they they talk about seventy percent normal maturation. The other 30%, it's a spectrum. So you'll have on one, one end, uh, the CP child or you know, the, the, the CNS pathology. But then there's this, this spectrum on the other end of the spectrum, uh, Yonda called it uh, minimal brain dysfunction. Um, I think uh, it's also called central coordination disorder. So there's, uh, maybe not that ideal uh, development, but 
uh, again, there, there's a spectrum to that. So that that may manifest during that the when we see the the cortical uh, time of central nervous system maturation. Maybe there is some um, learning disabilities or not uh, as efficient um, movement patterns. And this is something that uh, Prague School, as far as a curriculum, um, there's a whole pediatrics section during, with their curriculum, which they go deeper into that aspect of observation and uh, specific utilization of, of treatment options. So, um, so it usually with a, a healthy central nervous system maturation and a good environment for the child to explore movement and the variability of movement and do the, the trial and, and error and find their ideal points of support, you're going to see this nice healthy maturation things that may compromise that i mean we see in in modern society and culture the kids who a kid who's in their car seat you know six hours a day or um is maybe doesn't have that environment where they can explore um and i, I and think practice. another one that i remember michael sharing with me was when kids are sped up on milestones. So for example, right. you know, those, those seats that prematurely prop kids into a seated position. Jumpies. Yeah. Well, even or before the, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. you know, that little yeah. Bobby chair yeah. where, and again, we're all guilty of this. We stuck our, I know we stuck our kids in these things, at least the first two, because when our third kid came along, I was already interested in DNS. So then he became <laughs> right. sort of, uh, you know, the observation for DNS, but with our first two, yeah, you're going to stick them in those silly seated chairs and they're, you can't, they don't have the support before they're ready. Before they're ready. Yeah. So they can't even support their own weight. So they're in this slouch position. And then you put them in those things. We called it the circle of neglect. So it's like the thing where, you know, they're standing before they should be standing. Yes, yeah. Um, so all of these things actually interfere with the normal, uh, neuromuscular development. Yeah. Yeah. Put it, put, putting kids in shoes too early yes. probably does a tremendous disservice to them. Right. So I, ideally they're going to have an environment where they're going to kind of figure this out themselves versus you know, the, another one is the little walkers that they'll hold on to and, and walk. Um, you know, ideally they're going to play with their environment and uh, with that combination of healthy central nervous system maturation, find those ideal points of support and be able to uh, utilize that those motor patterns that are manifested with that healthy central nervous system. So uh, the environment that we, we have children in is key. And um, this, I mean, you can take this uh, and look at, you know, just our society, just with a, as adults. Well, yeah, you know, let's, let's, let's yeah. go from, okay. So we, we, we can put them in shoes too early, put them in silly sit up seats and the circle of neglect and give them walkers. And then another huge set of insults come when they go to school, right? Yes. Because now they're sitting in chairs yeah. for six or seven hours a day. Um, and, and what does that do for, uh, you know, a six or seven year old, which is unfortunately by the time they're six, they're sort of sitting in chairs six hours a day at least. Right. So what is that doing to interfere with this process? So this is where you, you start to see the, the start of that postural, um, the, those postural syndromes. Um, you know, when we get into those sustained seated postures, um, uh, one of the, um, main things that happens during those developmental milestones with healthy central nervous system maturation is we're able to line, keep alignment or approximation of the pelvic floor and the thoracic diaphragm. The more efficiently we do that, the more efficiently we manage intra-abdominal pressure and uprighting throughout the spine, and then again, transfer of force and load. If we fall into repetitive postures or postural habituation, which as a society is kind of a bit uh, prevalent 
Um, gravity is going to win no matter how, how nice the chair is. We're going to start to fall into that slumping posture. And we, when we get into that slumping posture, the folder, the shoulders coming forward, that is actually going to create uh, an inhibition of the, of the diaphragm's ability to descend. And again, we need that descending of the healthy and ideal descending of the diaphragm for both respiration and stabilization. So if we start getting uh, that descending becomes inhibited due to the, the postural habituation, our brain's going to find a way to get uh, air to the lungs. So it'll start to kick in the accessory breathing musculature, which is that the sternocleidomastoid, the upper traps, muscles called the scalenes, which attach to your uh, cervical spine and the, the upper two ribs. You'll see the pec minor also start to help to lift the thoracic cage to help get the expansion to get the air. So again, the, the brain just starts to do its job, which we need air. We're going to use these guys to get the air. But, and it's a good short-term kind of survival strategy, but if we do it often enough, that becomes the go-to pattern. So you'll see a change in respiratory pattern, meaning decrease utilization of full expansion of the diaphragm and more of a pattern of overutilizing the accessory breathing musculature, which... And this can occur quite young. I mean, I think when we, you know, we were joking about it yesterday, but you look at my youngest, I mean, his abdomen is huge. And uh, that's obviously an enormous asset to him. You can you see it when he breathes. It's his it's abdominal expansion more than it is thoracic expansion. Right. These you know a, a child that age, if doing thing you know if if developing normally, is not using any of these accessory respiratory muscles. Right. Um, and there's something about this anchor point being in the abdomen, right? I mean, one one of the first things I learned in DNS was how to regain intra-abdominal pressure yeah. through eccentric loading of that cylinder. And I, I, I don't think it had ever been presented to me how important that was because prior to that, any amount of uh, perceived intra-abdominal pressure had been acquired through concentric loading. Right. So for example, when trying to pick up something heavy, you can, you can take two strategies to that. I think, I think most people would agree if you wanted to pick up 300 pounds right now, you must generate pressure in the abdomen. I don't, I don't think anybody would assume that you could pick up 300 pounds, which is twice your body weight, without generating pressure here. But how you do it matters. Right. So explain those differences. And, and again, either with or without the developmental lens, but I, but I, I think that um, the developmental lens is always a great way to think about how kids move. Right. So, uh, if you think about developmentally and how that stabilizing stereotype, uh, evolves, think of it as a, an inside out strategy. You're creating an intra-abdominal pressure to load the abdominal wall. And then with the loading of the abdominal wall, eccentric, isometric, and then there's this interplay of all that activity, concentric, eccentric, isometric, to manage that pressure uh, for whatever task that you need to, to do. So if I'm sitting here and I'm going to pick up that pen, I don't, I need some, uh, function of stabilization to then, you know, move this limb, try to provide a fixed point for my anterior posterior slings to provide a nice position for the shoulder girdle to then again, get that synergy throughout the kinematic chain and pick up the pen. So there's a, a certain amount of management uh, of that intra-abdominal pressure that I need. If I go to like the chairs that we're sitting in that we, we, we moved earlier, this is a lot more weight. I'm going to need a lot more coordination and management and creation of intra-abdominal pressure to create the fixed point to transfer the ground reactive forces through my lower extremities, through my trunk and pelvis to, you know, my arms holding, holding the chair. So there's, uh, 
more facilitation of that intra-abdominal pressure. Um, so that's what we see developmentally, um, that quality of, of stabilization. And that stabilization, it's not static, it's, it's, it's dynamic. We should be able to manage that intra-abdominal pressure through full extension, full rotation, full flexion. That's the, the, the beauty of that dynamic neuromuscular st stability. And that's what we see with our, that quality we see in the high, high level athletes. The, we can also create stability by bracing. And if you think about bracing, if someone's gonna punch me in the stomach, I may go for a, a concentric. And where the, the abdominal wall shortens and tightens, I'm still creating a, uh, a stabilizing function and I can still use that to you know move objects or prepare prepare for for impact when it comes to dynamic movement the the uh, inside out strategy and the central nervous system management of that stabilization uh, allows me to create the stability efficiently where I need it but then also be able to, for example, relax uh, my extremity. So with, uh, with high level uh, movers, athletes, um, you see they'll have nice postural foundations. They also have very nice cortical function or body awareness. So the Fetters, the Kelly Slaters and, and surfing, they have that ability to their movement looks fluid and, and, and effortless. So they have that ability to relax and efficiently stabilize where they need to stabilize. Sometimes you need to uh, incorporate that bracing strategy on top of the, the facilitation of intra-abdominal pressure um, for excessive loads where we go beyond our threshold, our functional threshold meaning our ability to keep that quality of stabilization. Um, when we go beyond that ability, we go into what we call the, the functional gap. And when we go into the functional gap, that's where we see more of that high threshold strategy, maybe bracing strategy to get the job done, to get that weight up, to maybe kick that ball a little extra harder. Training wise and in athletics, that's where they, those athletes spend a lot of time because they're always, they're kind of pushing that threshold all the time. So um, you'll see with athletes um, a tendency, if they're spending all their time training, competing in that functional gap beyond the, the ability to maintain the um, a more, more efficient transfer of force and load, then that pattern, that high threshold compensatory pattern becomes the, starts to become the norm with everything, picking up the pencil. So one of the things that we try to do, um, or I try to do as far as with training and rehabilitation, not just with the athletes, but with, you know, the general population is help them, uh, facilitate that that quality of stabilization so they can increase that threshold of being able to main, you know, stay within that, that functional threshold or that functional capacity. Um, so that when they do have to go into the functional gap and go to those compensatory patterns, it's not all the time. Um, well, when, let's, let's talk about an elite athlete. And again, I think the thing with the really, the most elite is, they don't have to train in DNS. A lot of them are just doing this naturally. I mean, that's sort of what makes Roger Federer great. Right. And, and one of the hallmarks of that greatness is injury prevention. It's not just the greatness at what they do. It's the longevity with which yes. they can do it. Yes. So uh, when I lecture, I use Federer as an example. You know, you look at his career, just longevity and injury wise, um, you know, when he, he has been injured, but you usually see a quick recovery. Um, going back to Yager and Zelezny, um, Zelezny had a 20 year career in Javelin, which I don't think is very common. Yager is 48, he's still playing. 
Um, the with Yager and Jelesny, Pavel working with them, the emphasis was on uh, the awareness, the facilitation of, of this ideal stabilizing pattern, the timing of, of, of movement, the centration throughout the kinematic chain. And then with that, the ability to, we call it differentiate, you know, within, for example, the pelvis over that, that femoral head. So the focus was with, with them was the quality over quantity, I guess you can say. Like what Meaning, percentage of his time do you think, because obviously Federer has just an unbelievable so, yeah. functional capacity. Right. How long, how often do you think he is in excess of that, in that gap zone where he is using compensatory movements that are putting long-term uh, stability at risk? Right. So I think when you see, you see those athletes that rise to the top, they have that, uh, you watch like Federer, for example, you see the, point, the, the creating the point of support, the positioning, the alignment of everything. He's creating naturally that centration and that transfer of force and load. There's times maybe he gets out of position or a little extra hard where he's gonna go into that functional gap. He's naturally has a functional, huge functional capacity where he can maintain that. I think, uh, with him, you also, and this, this goes to, to training, he has a good team. He has uh, trainers that, you know, are programming certain things in a way and giving him certain things so that he can still facilitate that quality of movement and build uh, strength capacity on top of that. One, things, one thing that I see... For example, out on the like the, the PGA Tour, um, I'll see you know players that have good programs, good coaching. You know, they'll tend to stay within that functional capacity. They're still pushing it, and still you know with them, it's just repetitive motion, which postural habituation, repetitive motion injury are things that compromise that synergy and coordination of that dynamic stability. So if you have good programming, dosing, loading, timing, recovery, then, and on top of that, you have amazing you know, potty awareness and cortical function, you're going to see longevity and you're going to see nice quality of, of movement. What I see on the other end is players, athletes, poor training programs, overtraining, you know, spending too much time in the, the functional gap, um, you know, falling into what my colleague Rich, Rich Olm talks about, the extensor compression syndrome, which you see a lot with lifting with the, the power athletes, uh, which he works with a, a lot of. Um, then you see when you have that reliance on that higher threshold, you see more incidence of injury, longer recovery, versus the opposite, the, the Federers. Um, yeah, they get injured, but they recover fairly quickly. And that's what you see, again, Yager and, and Jelesny are nice examples of that. Both Czechs and Pavel working with them, you know, over this 20 year period of time, integrating and putting in his ideas and his uh, experience with everything that we talked about with those you know rehabilitation pioneers into these athletes um, kind of like a little you know test subject so to speak so now you Prague school and DNS practitioners that's what we're trying to help integrate uh, with our athletes with the general population. So what, what percentage of people that you work with are, um, coming with an injury and, and therefore in need of rehabilitation where you're now applying DNS to presumably go back to, Hey, this is where the breakdown was. Let's go back to where that breakdown would have occurred developmentally and go back and rebuild those steps. So we're going to, you're going to learn how to stabilize your neck or stabilize your head using 
the stabilizing muscles appropriately. You're going to learn how to generate concentric intra-abdominal pressure, and you're going to learn how to centrate ipsilaterally and contralaterally and all of these things. And then what percentage of your uh, patients are not coming with an injury, but are coming for performance enhancement and saying, you know, I just can't throw this fastball any faster than 89 miles per hour. And the only way I'm going to get that faster is if I can create a better whip between my right hand and my left leg and hip, you know, so those are two ends of the spectrum. And how do you spend your time on those? Right. So a majority of people are coming to me because pain and, and injury, uh, what happens, especially with the athletes, once we address that, once we calm down, whether it's, if it's an acute or a chronic injury, we calm, we decrease pain and, um, uh, and utilize the, the, there's different manual methods within DNS and then integrating the exercises that are based off of those developmental milestones. Once they get to a certain point, um, ideally I'm going to work with a trainer or with the coach and hopefully they're on the same, you know, mindset so that, uh, they can then progress to the strength training, to the, the specific technique. More and more, these athletes are, you know, it's a combination of once they're out of pain, uh, we work with the quality of stabilization and movement and transfer of force and load. Um, uh, the, let's the, take a group of, let's say, 100 athletes who come to you in pain. Again, just looking for rough numbers, what percentage of them will buy into the thesis of this very non-traditional way of rehabilitating is going to help? What percentage of that what, what of that hundred will stay with the program to get better? Right, not enough. So what's the number? <laughs> so, uh, 10, 20% maybe. That's it. Yeah. What I see happening, you know, for example, uh, Major League Baseball is integrating DNS more and more. So um, in San Diego with the Padres, I've started to consult with them a bit. Um, there's a, a hitting coach uh, for the Dodgers that comes in and we kind of workshop ideas uh, where you know he's integrating the DNS concepts and principles. So it's starting to get recognized more for that value as far as uh, the performance enhancement aspects of it. Culturally within sport, what I see, um, especially in the West, there's, you know, they want numbers. They want, okay, what's their, what's their lift? You know, what's their, their strength capacity, which is important, but I think it's also important to, uh, again, like integrate those two, the quality of movement and stability, and then uh, increasing that, you know, their their strength thresholds. But even just with an injury, so if you let's just say a hundred athletes that are, you know, let's say gymnasts and hockey players and football players that come in with lower back pain, you're saying only twenty of those would stick with the program until they got better. Uh, uh, Eighty of them would abandon the program before they improved. Um, a lot of times, and, and just across the patient population, a lot of times once once people are out of pain, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. They go back, they go back into their, their oh, patterns. Sorry. That, that's yeah. what I'm trying to differentiate, yeah. which is how many of them just stick with it long enough to get out of pain? The next question I'm going to ask is, once out of pain, how many of them stick with the program and switch basically from rehab to prehab? Um, so going back to that, one of my goals, especially with the athlete, once they're out of pain, we develop a uh, prehabilitation kind of program. And we utilize those, again, the, going back to the knowledge of developmental kinesiology and developmental milestones, which uh, later we'll, we'll actually go through. So based on what I'm seeing with their insufficiencies and with, with the insufficiency of that coordination of stabilization, I will give them 
certain things, certain sequences of movements and exercises that they practice uh, with awareness to facilitate better strategy for stability. And then that's part of their movement preparation or prehabilitation before whether it's their strength training or their technique training or going out and, and performing. And um, so that's, that's a larger percentage because that's part of what I kind of program into the, the rehabilitation. Um, so some athletes will get that and they're okay, great, this is, this is good, I'm gonna go do it. And then occasionally they're coming back and getting, uh, maybe we're adding to it based on what, how they're functioning now. Um, other athletes, they want more. And that's that, that's that smaller percentage. Part of it too, probably access, you know, and availability, um, uh, as far as being able to be, you know, in San Diego and working one-on-one -on -one with me. So, um, you know, there's, there's different factors that will, um, tie into how much they're, they're doing, but within the whole treatment protocol or rehabilitation protocol, I'm giving them things that they should then in integrate into their programs. What is the most common chief complaint of a person that walks into your office? Uh, is it lower back pain? That would be my guess. Yeah. Majority is low back. Okay. Yeah. So what are the most common causes of lower back pain that you see? Um, across the board, if, if they're suffering from, uh, you know, low back pain, uh, whether it's acute or chronic, usually there's an underlying pattern of that, uh, lack of, or the inefficient activation of the, the deep stabilizing system and more of a tendency towards that extension compression, you know, uh, activation, that overactivation of flexor extensor. So, you Explain know, you, what that means in a bit more detail, given the ubiquity of this injury and right. the probability that, uh, 80% of the people listening to this have already have experienced back pain, back pain or right. will experience back pain in their lives. I want to make sure if people take nothing away from this podcast, they understand the etiology of lower back pain. Yeah. So unless you've had a, let's say a car accident or a, a fall, that's like an acute injury. Um, that can be a cause of, of low back pain. The majority that I see, it's more of a, uh, chronic overload over time that, uh, if we have that strategy of, of flex too much flexure extensor activity, which compromises the positioning of the intersegmental, the, the joints and the transfer of force and load, then with the comp compensatory pattern, we'll see more of a hinging in through that lumbar sacral region. And with that hinging over time, you know, it's like if you keep bending a spoon, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna break, you weaken the, uh, the structure. So, you know, uh, take a disc pro. Uh, yeah, let's, you know, let's, yeah. let's talk about the actual anatomy. And I, yesterday I said, I wished I'd brought a skeleton. So the, the sacrum is a, is basically a single bone. It's actually fused. So it, it, as at one point it was multiple right. bones sacrum but, with the ilium. Yeah. Right. So, so you have this sort of one fused sacrum and then you have these five lumbar discs numbered one through five. Now between each of those lumbar, um, vertebral bodies is a disc. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's one between the, uh, fifth lumbar vertebral body and the, uh, sacrum. So, uh, we refer to them as, you know, L3, L4 is the disc between three mm -hmm. and four and L5, S1 is the disc between there. Right. Um, behind each of these vertebral bodies. So these, these vertebral bodies are sort of held in place. 
um, by the discs, but then also by the facet joints yes. that run behind them. And it's really difficult to show this. We'll probably have to pull up some images uh, yeah. to make this easier for people to see. Um, but the, the facet joints and the and then sort of the lamina, which are these those sort of longer bones, hold it all together, but they don't really provide this support. I think the support is probably at the facet joints and at the disc interface. Is that probably fair? Yeah. And then think of all the musculature as the scaffolding yeah and the you know the levers and you know uh, that help with that stabilization and then the the activation of of that deep stabilization as an uprighting effect and let's talk about which muscles are on the front of that so if you were to cut me open here mm -hmm. and let's just say you pull everything out of the way so you pull my bowel out of the way you pull everything and you go yeah. right down onto my spine what are the muscles you're going to see that are attached to the anterior or front portion of my vertebral bodies? So two, two main ones that we can talk about is the psoas, which uh, attaches to those transverse processes of the, the lumbar spine, and then the quadratus lumborum, uh, which also attaches to those processes. Both of those, they with those attachments they also come up and they attach right where the the diaphragm attaches the crura of the of the diaphragm so you know if you and again maybe you can pull up those images and or put it on the show notes um so you see uh the um uh, all those kind of coalescing in that thoracic lumbar region if if i have that ideal activation of that descending of the diaphragm and the facilitation of that intra-abdominal pressure, that pressure again loads the, the, the abdominal wall and creates that fixed point that the psoas and the uh, quadratus um, are, are anchoring off of. If that's compromised, they don't have anything to anchor off of. And then you, you see that excessive extension and that overload of those facet joints and with so show, exaggerate what the extension posture looks like so people can see it so uh you'll you your hips will will move forward so you'll, you're if you picture your pelvis as a bowl you're tipping the bowl forward tipping the bowl forward and then if you think of your rib cage the rib cage is coming forward as well um so uh, your spine which normally has a bend in it gets more of excessive, a bend excessive yeah. yeah and with that uh, uh oblique position of the diaphragm and the pelvic floor now there's a, a mechanical uh, disadvantage of the abdominal wall so we took a cylinder that's supposed to sit like this and, and we, we made it, it like go that. like this so now uh, the tendency is going to be the extensor over activity and the flexor, the psoas. So now you're just getting this repetitive compression on those facet joints, and the disc is getting this repetitive uh, hinging flexion. And then in the center of the disc, we have the, 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 the fluid or the, the nucleus working its way through those annular fibers as they weaken. And then that's where you get the disc uh, protrusions or, you know, it's, uh, substance can leak out and the body will, you know, go into that, that spa, that protective spasm also. So you'll, you'll see the disc injury, but then you also see over time facet hypertrophy. So the, the degenerative changes and the accumulation of, of bony material trying to help stabilize. So part of my story and kind of discovering uh, or drove me into uh, utilizing DNS, discovering Prague School, I developed what was called a spondylolysis, which is a, 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 a stress fracture in the spine, part of the, the, the PARS, which is you know, kind of that, that arch that attaches the vertebra and then the, to the facet joints. So for me, with overtraining, uh, poor recovery, uh, poor postural foundations, um, I was premature 
and um, looking back, knowing what I know now, looking at pictures or videos of myself, I could see that that compensatory pattern. It didn't catch up to me till till college. You know, especially as we're younger, we have a huge ability to compensate and we can get away with stuff. But in college, it caught up to me with the uh, with that that stress fracture. So. Um, I was kind of like the poster boy of upper and lower cross syndrome and lack of efficient uh, stabilizing strategy. I had plenty of motivation and drive and, and practice, you know, hour upon hour. But at a certain point, you know, structure overload of, you know, in that, that for me, L4, L5 region, that gave way. And when that gave way, um, then I went into this whole chronic pain cycle and it wasn't until, uh, you know, I went orthopedist, uh, physical therapist, chiropractic, all of them helped in their own way, but it was, I was missing. I knew there was something missing. So probably for selfish reasons, I went into this profession trying to figure out my own pain and try to figure out how to recover and uh you know in in medical school and same in chiropractic school first year you're just getting bombarded with all anatomy physiology functional biomechanics all of it was amazing and interesting but i'm like this isn't helping me it wasn't until the second year where i was introduced to uh prog school yonda and levitt and what they were teaching it was like oh finally something made sense and just intuitively it made sense to to what i was dealing with so i started to you know learn more and more about that while i was in school uh, incorporating some of the treatment methods and the, the exercises and that that got me you know further along of kind of pulling myself out of uh, my own kind of chronic pain and then in uh once i was out of school uh, 97, 98, um, after a few years, there was a clinician, uh, Dr. Liebenson taking small groups over to Prague to learn from those, the, uh, you know, those pioneers and those, those Prague therapists. Um, so I was able to go over there. It was like an eight day, uh, intensive kind of lectures and, and workshops, got to see Levitt. Uh, but unfortunately, the year before, uh, Yonda had passed away. And I believe Voita had passed away, I think, early 2000, 2000 2001. Um, but that's, that was my uh, first introduction to uh, Professor Pavel Kolaj. And at that time, it was his ideas talking about developmental kinesiology and then utilizing that that knowledge to develop the assessments and the the treatment strategies not only you know to the cerebral palsy population but then you know he's talking about the adults and then and then the sports population so once i saw that again that was like another light bulb and another piece of that puzzle for me to to work my way out of it out of my own uh, situation um, and then from 2003, basically I've watched this, this evolution of DNS, the concepts and principles turn into the actual name and then the curriculum of, of where we're at now. Now you're, you're quite senior within the, 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 the sort of international community of DNS. Uh, you're one of only 18 international instructors. Isn't that about right? Yeah. yeah. What, what are the different levels of certification within DNS? The, the highest level being where you're at. That's, can anybody attain that level or do you have to, you know, be a chiropractor, a physician or an osteopathic physician? Like what are the, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's three tracks of the dynamic neuromuscular stabilization curriculum one is a clinical track it's a dns a b and c and then the fourth course is a d course which you actually go to prog and it's like an intensive uh with the with the prog therapist 
Um, there's a specific exercise sport uh, sequence of courses. There's three courses there. The first one is focused in, in clinicians only type of thing. The second one is designed for trainers as well as clinicians because ideally we, we designed that one because we want the two populations working together and on the same page. Um, but it's a little more focused towards, uh, you know, less manual and more of what, how you can integrate it into a training program. The third is, uh, pediatrics where you're going to utilize the DNS handling skills with, with infants. And that's a, a series of, um, I believe three courses with a, you know, the fourth culminating in, in Prague. Um, so that curriculum, I believe started to come about 2009. And then off of that, we have specialty courses, uh, where we integrate, you know, um, different things. One of Prague schools, goals it's you know they, they don't want dns to be a this is a dns technique these are concepts and principles that professor collage you know building on those those founders and his experience and his his ideas um it's meant to be integrated into everything else because it can, that's one thing i love about it is um, you can easily integrate it into the good work that you're already doing, whether you're a trainer, whether you're a clinician and you do a specific technique, you know, for example, the Prague th school therapists, they do, they do visceral mobilization. They have specific soft tissue and mobilization techniques, and they're constantly exploring and trying to evolve, you know, the, the teaching and the, and the integration. So, um, it's a a nice knowledge base and skill set to have uh, again to enhance what you're already doing and and so i mean this afternoon we're going to go down and actually demonstrate a lot of this stuff by video because i think that it's really challenging to talk about this stuff it's just not that amenable to a discussion um it really has to be shown mm -hmm. um and frankly, even showing it is challenging. I think experiencing it is uh, is the gold standard. That's the that's the ultimate. Um, it's not just movements. It's not just specific exercises. But it's facilitating the awareness of the um, the ideal stabilization and the the support. Um, and then with that, you know, with with my patients or whether it's training. Um, I want my patients or my athletes to feel the that synergy and feel that uh, ability to stabilize where they need to, but then also relax where they need to. And it's a there's a little bit of a process. It's not a, a cookie cutter thing like just do this, this, this. Um, you have to put some work into it. You have to practice it both as a patient and as a a clinician or, or trainer and I guess that would be you know maybe uh, one of the drawbacks for people is um, you know everything out there people are doing doing good work and, and trying to help people um, and if you know they have something that's working for them and we introduce these concepts and principles and they're not easily integrated then um, maybe they don't they don't adapt them or they'll ad adapt a portion of them which is you know fine as well um but it's it's something that uh in the curriculum uh you know we try to emphasize the the need for um you know uh, feeling and, and practicing the the movements that we can show later I mean, I can only speak for myself, um, but I wonder if <clears throat> my generalization is correct. I, I think my guess would be that the people who come to DNS late in life with an injury get better, but then stick with it are probably people who like to really tinkle, tinker with things and like to toil away and don't 
necessarily need quick results, but can sort of anchor to a philosophy. They sort of have faith in it and then they can sort of keep pursuing it because um, <clears throat> it, A, you don't, it, 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 it feels a lot of the time like you're not doing much, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think for someone who's used to, you know, being quite impatient with what they, you know, I want results today and, you know, hey, I just started CrossFit and two days later I'm doing power cleans. Like, this is awesome. Um, and and if, if, that's the, if that's the dopamine surge that a person right. needs, they're going to, I think they're going to struggle with a system where you might spend a week, you know, daily practicing learning how to breathe again. Um, and you'll never stop practicing that, by the way. You'll never stop practicing, you know, a really great breathing pattern and a really great pattern of accessing these deep stabilizing muscles we've spoken about and practicing all of these infant like movements. And yes, it gets more challenging over time and you do these flows that become quite enjoyable um, and can be very challenging. I mean, there, most of these things I still can't even do actually, especially with weight. Um, but <clears throat> I don't know, I guess I would say, I always think of, um, things in medicine through the lens of efficacy and effectiveness. So efficacy is how well does something work if it's adhered to correctly. Mm -hmm. Effectiveness is if you just throw it out in the real world, how well does it work? Right. To me, DNS might be the single most efficacious thing I have ever come across as far as you know, healing injury and preventing injury. I'm not sure if it's the most effective thing, which is not a knock on it, but the point is, to your point earlier, a lot of people aren't going to do it, you know, especially once you get them out of pain, they're not going to want to stay with it. Now, I don't know why that is, um, but that's the thing that I would hope that DNS can improve upon in the next decade. It's only a decade old, but it's like, how do we take this thing that is so efficacious, again, meaning if a person actually does it, they're going to get better. Right. It's almost impossible not to fix back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, like all of these injuries, they're, they're going to get better. Where, where we want to do it is make sure that, hey, people, you know, we want 90% of people to be able to stick to it once they start. Right. Um, Part of that is with the curriculum, whether you're a clinician or a trainer, the part of the process is with the assessment you're training your eye just like a good coach will recognize um you know something not right with the the runner or the tennis player or the the golf swing um you know you can uh dns will have the specific assessment and those specific exercises based off of development once you develop your eye and recognize where the insufficiencies are you can recognize that insufficiency of stability within the, the swing, within the running, within the, the lift. So you can, in, in my opinion, um, you can get to the point where you can utilize these concepts and principles, communicate them in a way, you know, to the deadlift or um, to the runner where uh, you can help them in that manner. Maybe they're not doing the specific developmental movement, but you're giving them ideas as far as loading, cueing, that will facilitate that um, that efficiency. So, um, and, and that's the challenge you're dealing with in Major League Baseball is, you know that there's a way to get an extra four miles an hour out of a pitch, but you also know that that athlete probably doesn't want to, or doesn't have the time to maybe, I would argue they should have the time to, but maybe doesn't want to go back and do right. all of the fundamental movements and master what a, what an infant does. So now your challenge is while you're on the pitching mound, how do I put a principle in you that's going to create a little more whip like stability? Right. Part of that is training up the staff that will be dealing with that athlete full, full time. The more uh, skilled and, and you know movement towards mastery of that, the better it's gonna be for the, the people that they work with. So part of that is that process, that education, that, that learning process. And um, 
that's what I see you know, people starting to, to ask for, to, to help with. Because a lot of people will, will take the coursework and they're like, oh man, yeah, that's, that's awesome. How do I integrate it? And that's also um, part of the curriculum. We've created sp kind of specialty courses. So for example, um, there's certain expertise within Prague School. We have a Prague therapist that um, focuses on the running athlete. We have one of the instructors danced professionally. So we have a, you know, a dance specific exercise sport course. We've done golf, we've done uh, baseball. Uh, Dr. Ohm has a strength specific, lifting specific course talking about that integration. So we're, we're trying to create um, uh, kind of that curriculum to help with that integration. Because if we just have the standard courses, you know, more of that's going to tend to be clinical. Um, and, uh, but if we show how to actually do the integration within the specialty course, whoever's working with those athletes or an athlete themselves, that's going to be, we're going to be able to communicate it better because they understand that, um, you know, that sport. We've even done, we've done, uh, you know, a hockey specific. Um, one of the Czech therapists works with the national, Czech national hockey team. So obviously huge, you know, experience. And then we, we show the integration. So that's part of that evolution of trying to communicate these concepts and principles better, help people integrate them better so that we can, again, en enhance what we're doing with our patients and, and with our athletes or with our, you know, people that want to focus on performance. Well, Michael, this has been, this has been interesting. And I think it's going to get a lot more interesting when we, when we go and roll around on the mats a little bit and, and, um, I think give a little bit more of a visual explanation of what a lot of this stuff looks like. So thanks so much for sharing your insights and, uh, Great. Uh, keeping up the fight. Thank you. That went faster than I thought. And I, I just feel like we scratched the surface. So uh, I know, I know. looking forward to, to showing it, to help people, uh, understand it a little bit better. Thank you. Yeah. And, and hopefully once people see it, they'll want to take that next step, which is feeling it. And I, I truly, I truly think that only when you feel this, do you, do you understand it? And I think that's true of not just DNS. I think that's true of PRI and FRC and all these other things right. that we've spoken about that in my mind all have a place in both the world of rehab and prehab. Yeah. If you, if you can feel it, then you can start to integrate it and, you know, create that, that, uh, new pattern. Awesome. So, thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The Drive. If you're interested in diving deeper into any topics we discuss, we've created a membership program that allows us to bring you more in-depth, exclusive content without relying on paid ads. It's our goal to ensure members get back much more than the price of the subscription. Now, to that end, membership benefits include a bunch of things. One, totally kick-ass comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, thing we discuss on each episode. The word on the street is nobody's show notes rival these. Monthly AMA episodes or Ask Me Anything episodes, hearing these episodes completely. Access to our private podcast feed that allows you to hear everything without having to listen to spiels like this. The Qualies, which are a super short podcast that we release every Tuesday through Friday, highlighting the best questions, topics, and tactics discussed on previous episodes of The Drive. This is a great way to catch up on previous episodes without having to go back and necessarily listen to everyone. Steep discounts on products that I believe in, but for which I'm not getting paid to endorse and a whole bunch of other benefits that we continue to trickle in as time goes on. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, you can head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all with the ID Peter Atia MD. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you listen on. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. 
The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.